Well, thanks everybody for coming out. My name is Rick Rosso. I hold the Wadwani Chair in U.S. India Policy Studies here at CSIS. And uh, do, not, do not blink your eyes, stop that blinking. You, ex you actually have two Wadwani chairs here on stage at the same time, and actually a third here in the uh, front row, Ambassador <laughs> Rick Enderfirth, who got this program launched. And, uh, um, but uh, Heyman Singh is uh, the Wadwani Chair in U.S. India Policy Studies uh, based at ICRIR, which is India's finest uh, think tank. So a very unique partnership that CSIS and ICRIR have, um, which the Wadwani Foundation uh, funds chairs in both countries, which has provided some, uh, some pretty unique ways to try to influence debate and provide uh, great insights to both governments. I think, you know, probably uh, my favorite was when both sides issued the two reports on Bit and Beyond, on what each side would like to see out of a bilateral investment treaty. And for those of us that work so much on U.S.-India relations, uh, too often it's, it's one hand clapping. You know, the United States wants to do this, India wants to do that. Um, having a, uh, a co-chairs on both sides of the ocean has provided a pretty unique opportunity um, to actually have uh, views uh, uh, shared on, on both sides on, on common issues. So it's been pretty unique, and it's great to have uh, Ambassador Singh here today, uh, visiting Washington, uh, helped doing a lot of uh, briefings uh, for our friends in government and outside of government on what this election means. Uh, certainly you've all heard uh, people like me and others that have watched it from 6,000 miles away try to give you uh, what insights we have, but uh, now you're gonna get it from the real deal. Uh, Ambassador Singh, I'm sure, as you all know, uh, has a, a long and distinguished career in the Foreign Service, joining in 1974, serving in a variety of positions, uh, including in the United States, um, but most notably at the end of his career in the Foreign Service, uh, served as a couple of ambassadorships, uh, both to Indonesia and to Japan. Uh, and upon his retirement in December 2010, he moved to ICRIR to be the Wadwani Chair in India-U.S. Policy Studies. Uh, he's also joined on stage a special guest here, uh, Sanjay Pul uh, uh, Pulapaka, is also with, uh, with the Wadwani Chair at ICRIR and has uh, helped to, uh, to prepare a lot of the, uh, the work that they've been doing so far. And you may notice a slight accent from Sanjay because he uh, studied in the, uh, Mount, the, Appalachia, or the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Shenandoah Mountains here in Virginia itself. So if you hear that uh, Virginia mountain accent, you know that where that comes from. Uh, so let me turn the floor over to our chief guest, uh, Ambassador Heyman Singh, sir. Thank you, Rick, for that uh, introduction. Thank you for the remarks directed at me. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be back in Washington and to be among friends at CSIS. I see Rick Indefirth and Don Kemp sitting right there. Uh, we've been partners in launching these chairs uh, together for the last three years. And of course, we greatly value the uh, ongoing partnership with Rick Rosso, who just joined as India Chair at CSIS. Um, I, I think that the, the jokes will come at the end, because the, the, that's, that is something which uh, will probably uh, be helped out by uh, the comments of Rick and, <laughs> and Sanjay. Please direct all your difficult questions to them and leave the easy ones for me. Uh, since uh, this is just about three weeks since a new government was formed in India, um, I've been, I was wondering all along what, how, what shape to give these remarks uh, to be able to reach out to you and to convey a fairly accurate sense of what has happened. Uh, and I decided that, uh, well, we originally this title says Indian policy priorities, et cetera, under Prime Minister Modi. Now, um, at best, we can make an early assessment with just three weeks down uh, for the government. But it's better to understand at a much more fundamental level what the Modi phenomenon means for India uh, and understand the kind of change that India's social, political, and economic space has undergone over the last several months of the election and then with the result. Uh, it wasn't an ordinary election. My prediction is that uh, in years to come, 2014 will be seen as a watershed with the potential to transform India's political ethos and model of governance. Now, since the morning, I've been giving the same remarks at different uh, 
uh, events with US entities and government entities in, in DC. But uh, uh, it does occur to me that neither in India nor abroad have we really captured how much of change this represents. So I will walk you through some of those changes which I anticipate happening. Now, of course, 814 million people uh, registered to vote and 551 million voting, 66% uh, of uh, voter turnout, extraordinarily high, even from Indian uh, uh, past Indian experiences where the average has been roughly in the last three elections, 55%. Uh, almost a million polling stations, electronic voting, results out in three hours, four hours. It's, it's a, it was quite a remarkable festival of democratic transition of government. And uh, what we saw at the end was that for the first time ever since we were independent, a non-Congress party, the BJP, secured a parliamentary majority on its own. And our foundational party, the Congress, uh, which has ruled us for most of the time since we were free, uh, suffered its first ever result since we gained independence. Now, there's lots of myths and assumptions about Modi and, and the victory or uh, non-victory, et cetera. I'll run you through some of them and then give you some of the counterfacts. Uh, first myth. And I must say that uh, virtually ev every assumption of India's established left liberal commentariat proved to be wrong. First one, Modi is too politically divisive a figure to ever successfully lead the BJP. In fact, the Modi factor will help the Congress to come back to power. Second, India's vote is fragmented and there is no prospect of any party securing a majority, not now, not in the future, so we have a permanence of the coalition era. Third, that there is no Modi wave, none. It's just a notion and a creation of the media and business who support him. Now, these are actual uh, uh, trends of, of thinking uh, which we witnessed across the election and post poll, the denial of a Modi victory has continued. And I'll give you some examples of that. Well, the BJP only secured 31% of the vote. The Congress in 1984 and the Janata in 1977 have done better than Modi did. Uh, there's an unfair kind of an edge which Modi secured from media, business, even non-resident Indians, social media he used, uh, et cetera, et cetera, gave him an edge. Uh, he does not have a unique mandate to govern. And this is a good nugget from Washington, D.C. itself. The Modi factor in the BJP's victory is not statistically substantiated. He gained from anti-incumbency and won as he convinced his party that it could succeed. Now, I mean, th these are real uh, commentaries which have come, which give you an idea of the sense of disbelief and, and cynicism which has pervaded this entire uh, time. And the, it does not recognize the hope and the change which Mr. Modi represents. The left in India, which has been decimated, uh, ha has now started appealing for proportional representation. But of course, that won't help them either because cumulatively they got 4% of the vote and there's always a cutoff for national vote uh, in terms of proportional representation, so they won't, they won't have gained from proportional representation even if there was a system like that in India. What are the counterfacts? The counterfacts are that the pre-poll alliance formed by the BJP secured a massive 38.5% of the vote as against a cumulative 23% for the Congress and its allies. Congress with 19% of the vote and the communists with 4% of the vote were comprehensively defeated, as were most caste-based parties. All parties which supported the UPA2 government were marginalized. 
Those which opposed the UPA to government were rewarded. Now, this election has set aside the assumption about the presumed permanence of a coalition era and the inevitable strengthening of regional parties in India. Uh, in fact, this time, the non-Congress, non-BJP uh, nationwide, the rest vote came down from 53% in the last election to 49%, first time below the 50% mark. The BJP successfully transcended its supposedly inherent political limitations and geographical boundaries. So we don't have that map up here, but uh, basically there's a map which you would have seen in The Economist, which is taken from the Indian Election Commission, which shows you the length and breadth of India, and virtually all of it is pink, which is, which, which is the color which they gave the, uh, the BJP. Um, indeed, the, the BJP turned out to be more successful than the, the Congress in forging regional alliances. Uh, taken together, if you take the two national parties and their alliances, they secured 62.5% of the vote as against 375 for the so-called third front, which is again very significant in terms of the trends which we have witnessed for the last two and a half decades and what we see now happening at this election. Uh, what's the result in broad terms? Our our political system, our economic space has taken a comparatively, a comparatively right of center economic model sort of a turn, that's one. And then you see voter consolidation on a development governance platform across the country. And that's part of the phenomenon which created this massive wave which, which led uh, Mr. Modi to an outright victory. This implies another few things. Uh, Eclipse of India's left liberal Anglophile elite and proponents of India's democratic underachievement. Now that's been, they've had their turn in power. They've run the country in a certain way. They have imposed limitations on the country's growth, its social progress. And well, sometime or the other, this eclipse was going to be inevitable. And it's a triumph for whom? It's a triumph for the vast majority of India's rural, urban heartland, small town, vernacular speaking, neo middle class. Now, that's something which was happening in the last two elections. The government was not noticing it. It was ascribing different reasons for the success of the Congress in 2004 and 2009. But I was always, having studied foreign countries, and their governance systems and their democratic elections and analyzed them and reported on them, uh, stuck my neck out as they say in the, in, in the diplomatic uh, world, saying this will happen, that will not happen, etc. Having, having, having uh, uh, seen all that happen, I was always wondering when would some change like this happen in India? Well, it's happened now. And what we have is if you go back to the two paradigms or the two ways of governing India after we became independent, one was partly, one was Nehruvian, one was Mr. Patel who was his partner in the Congress party. Uh, this is a return to the other model. So we have a socially conservative, business friendly, nationalist, not in terms of assertion, but in terms of getting India somewhere and a voting public which prefers or appears to prefer a more decisive use of political power to uplift their condition. So this, th these are the things which I see have been delivered. By the now the Modi factor, which already I mentioned, many people are very cynical about whether there was a Modi factor. The main reason for Mr. Modi's success was his demonstrated intention to lead and to take responsibility. Not merely for securing power for his party or for himself, but for a transformative effect on the entire nation. Now this becomes a part of this 
of a good democratic model of governance as an instrument of change and power as an instrument of change. Uh, and he represents that completely. Um, his party calls it the politics of performance. And clearly, that prevailed over the traditional politics of identity, which have ruled uh, in India. Um, even Modi's campaign is somewhat critically judged by his opponents who are in disbelief at his success. Because as he put it himself, it is the biggest mass mobilization exercise of its kind in the history of elections. And he crafted a campaign which was presidential style, which involved tireless amount of appearances in, at hundreds of mass rallies, thousands of uh, smaller events, uh, complete utilization of the full spectrum of media initiatives, social media, uh, to uh, reach out to the public and give them an idea of what he represents. And what does he represent and what did he project to the people when he was doing all this? Development, jobs, good governance. He made no reference to the election to either the traditional politics of identity or appealed to vote banks to come and support him. Um, so with all that, India has just had a presidential style campaign. This is first for, for our type of uh, uh, parliamentary democracy. And uh, he promises now a CEO style leadership, uh, which is the, the, the new uh, uh, avatar of Modi since he has been elected to power. Uh, I would say that uh, it's early days, but he does appear to be poised to be a transformative Indian prime minister. I have three or four implications for India in the long term, and then I will move on to his economic agenda and to foreign policy. But please do pay some attention to the implications for India. The, what Modi projected was a new model of inclusion resting primarily on economic empowerment of all citizens, with all, development for all, and greater national cohesion, one India, strong India. The subtext of this, of course, impl implies uh, an economically unified India and not many Indias, which has been a kind of a standard norm and accepted across the board. <clears throat> Second implication, the members of this so-called neo-middle class, which he targeted, they obviously decided to shed their traditional identity to vote as individuals, which can, to my mind, help India progress towards a more egalitarian society with a common national identity and eventually a uniform civil code, which is the, mo which is the norm in all modern democracies. The potential for addressing or redressing issues of quotas and reservations which have seen Indian citizenry being broken down into ever smaller identity groups for the allotment of entitlements, that now clearly exists. And it exists in the shape of moving towards a universal access model to lift and uplift the truly marginalized and then eventually to phase out reservations. So uh, this, this, this is, again, a, a prospective thing. It's not happening. It, it will obviously face resistance. But the, the seeds of this change have already been planted. Restoring the idea of India from compulsory group identities to individual freedoms and a common citizenship promised by the Constitution. This is a big, huge leap if it actually occurs. Because <clears throat> our Constitution promised us individual rights and freedoms and a single common citizenship. But the way we were governed for 60 years fragmented India over and over again into, into uh, communities which were then each of them apportioned enough to keep them happy. But they were sep treated separately. And you had uh, uh, more community identity 
than you had individual identity. This is a very modern uh, 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 democratic, uh, let's say, practice. And hopefully, it'll come to India as well. Now, you, some will, will still say that, or will he go back to some kind of uh, regressive, right-wing, narrow agenda? I think nobody recognizes more than Modi himself that there is no scope for narrow or exclusive agendas, exclusivist agendas in the diversity and plurality of India. And India is a multi-religious uh, country. It will always need to be nurtured as a pluralistic society. And I think he's shown amply uh, since he got elected to power by, by being very inclusive in his approach and by reaching out across the board, uh, that, that's, how, that's how he sees the reality and he recognizes that. Political stability going forward, well, they've got 336 out of uh, 543 seats in the Lok Sabha. It can be increased by a couple more after the new inductions which are still pending. In the Rajya Sabha, they have an, uh, only 63 out of 250 seats. So how will they govern if, the, if legislation has to be passed? In the short term, before the Rajya Sabha uh, over, over the years becomes slightly different in its composition, um, they can resort constitutionally to the joint session of the, of the houses. And in a joint session, the BJP and its partners currently have 401 out of 795 uh, seats, which is a plurality. Now, this does not include uh, dozens of regional parties which may just join in voting for what the government proposes, but this is just purely a, the math as it exists uh, on the ground today. Uh, in the coming two years, we are going to have a series of state elections across India. And uh, BJP currently rules seven out of, the, out of the 21 major states of India. The number seven is likely to go up to 14 by the time this cycle of elections is over sometime in 2015, uh, which will give uh, the BJP uh, across the board much greater con political control and presence uh, in India. Uh, and will, which will help Modi's efforts to enlist the cooperation of states on his policy agenda for One India, Strong India. So that's the, that is the uh, introduction, and I'm done with the election. Uh, move on a little bit to give you a, a snapshot of his uh, domestic and his foreign policy agendas. Um, domestic agenda. Uh, First impulse Modi on coming to power, apart from the fact that he uh, swore in a cabinet which had only 45 instead of 75 members, tried to rationalize many of the ministries uh, so that things which are handled in a cohesive manner can be so handled within the government. Um, he prioritized the ramping up of governance mechanisms for efficient delivery and policy implementation. Now, that's the word which has gone out everywhere across the government. There's a new, new buzz in town. Ministers arrive at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, there, there, are, there are things happening all over the place. Uh, uh, ideas for the future are sought at two-hour notice. Uh, you know, the, it's, it's a completely different ball game. Uh, the PMO, which is the Prime Minister's office, uh, has been restored as the hub of cohesive decision making within the government. And Modi uh, has also given himself the portfolio of handling, quote, all important policy issues, unquote. So basically, you know where the buck stops, you know from where the direction is coming, and all decision making has been taken away from these fragm fragmented groups of of ministers which had been constituted in the previous group, uh, 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 government and transferred back to the cabinet committees which are meant to handle them, uh, which means that decisions will get taken in cabinet 
the way our Constitution provides and uh, will be taken with accountability and responsibility uh, and on time. Now, his 10 point, now much has been written about these 10 points and 100 days and things like that. Um, his 10 point agenda for governance is pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, dynami dynamizing the bureaucracy, increasing ta government transparency, focusing on public services, which means education, health, water, and energy, spurring infrastructure and investment, addressing the economic challenges, including through the budget, leveraging modern technologies for enhanced efficiency and monitoring of government services, and enlisting the cooperation of all Indian states. That's his governance mantra. That's the template which across the board he, he crafted on day one and said, you have it, this is the way we are all going to go. Now, restoring the health of the economy is first among many of the subjects which he's taking up. Uh, there are just four areas there, employment, infrastructure, manufacturing, and investor sentiment. Now, you remember that throughout the campaign, Modi said, there is no red tape, there's only a red carpet for investors. He realizes that for the new middle class and its aspirations to be fulfilled, he needs the private sector to step in big time and, and come in and help grow the economy. So focus on investment, private investment, entrepreneurship, that's writ large in his agenda. Uh, the next is a more difficult task, but it's, he's already started that by reconstituting uh, issues around the prime minister's office. That is restoring the faith of the public in government ins institutions <clears throat> and reversing the rather entrenched institutional inefficiencies which have eroded public trust. I think that is one of the most important uh, elements which he has to tackle. He has been already able to unleash some of the animal spirits as reflected in our stock markets and, our, and uh, apart from the recent developments in Iraq, which have dampened things a little bit, things have been going rather well since uh, the new government was constituted. Now, the budget will definitely be a test for his reformist instincts, and it's coming in two weeks' time. Uh, Mr. Modi has pointed out that the government coffers were left practically empty by the outgoing government. And there's a huge overhang of payments which are still pending in the new year. It reduces the scope of the government to, to spur growth through spending. But nonetheless, he said, be prepared for some pain in the short term. And I promise you a budget which will be an investor-friendly budget. I can't say anything more because the budget processes in India are very, very closely held. That, that process is currently the, the, the discussions and, and, uh, and deliberation on that is ongoing. Now, his, his, uh, his immediate challenges, which as he, as he crafts the budget, he has these issues of food inflation, deficit, uh, subsidies, inflexible labor markets, bad land acquisition law passed last year, Many of these issues <coughs> we'll have to wait and see in the coming months. Could I just get a little bit of that water, please? Thanks. Uh, uh, as he goes along. Um, one thing which he has already got the government system to be moving on is to, to conduct a tax, a comprehensive review of uh, the foreign direct investment limits and, and to start the process of opening up virtually everything except one or two areas where there, is, there will be some residual restrictions. And um, the overall blueprint for his 60 months in, in office, five-year term of Indian government, uh, was given in tremendous detail uh, in the president's address to the Indian parliament a week ago. Uh, it's quite an unprecedented sort of a address because it spells virtually everything out that we will do this and we will do that. It's not, it's not detailed in the sense of uh, how will we do it and what will be, uh, you know, 
uh, deploy, but it gives a clear picture. And I'll just read two things out of that, two or three things. The states and the center in India are an organic team India. We believe in cooperative federalism. Now, this has been a perennial case for dysfunction in India. Uh, oh, well, the center can't do it because the states don't do it. The states can't do it because all of them are not together, uh, et cetera, et cetera. His, his idea is very clear. He's been a chief minister for 12 years, a very successful one. And he knows where the central government has neglected the participation of the states in taking the whole country forward on a single platform. Um, now, his inclusive policies basically focus on agriculture, reviving agriculture. Don't forget the fact that in the 12 years he was chief minister of Gujarat, the agricultural growth rate in that state was 9.5% per year, three times the national average. And uh, this was really at the heart of the so-called uh, Gujarat phenomenon, because uh, yes, industry was marching along trade, uh, manufacturing, other areas, but the rural heartland in a normally water deficient state was doing fine and was galloping along as well. Um, he has signaled zero tolerance towards extremism and terrorism, which is good because uh, uh, I think that there's no brand of uh, religious extre extremism which uh, India's diverse society would like to see erupting. Um, for business, and uh, in America, there are a lot of concerns about business. Let me read one line. A predictable, transparent, and fair economic policy environment, rationalization and simplification of tax regime to make it non-adversarial and conducive to investment, enterprise, and growth. Now, I don't know what else the budget will have, but on current reckoning, this element should be reflected in the budget when it comes out in 10 days' time. Uh, he's also spoken about massive uh, infrastructure development works, high-speed trains, modernization of ports, new cities, 100 new cities, hinterland connectivity. Uh, and for his focus on labor-intensive manufacturing, obviously, it will not be possible unless he undertakes some really, really long delayed labor reforms, so which will be good for the economy as well. Okay, the turn to foreign policy. Mm. There is no doubt at all that India's external profile will stand to gain from the prospect of a strong leadership and a stable government, which is likely to engage the world with much greater vigor than has been the case in the past. Modi is unquestionably a nationalist. He is deeply committed to India's emergence as a strong, self-reliant, self-confident power. Uh, he will have a powerful impact on India's foreign policy. Reviving interest in engaging India and driving bilateral initiatives abroad. Now, I personally do not agree with commentators who see some continuity uh, or largely continuity with either Mr. Vajpayee's uh, BJP government or the UPA, I really see much greater change and dynamism rather than continuity in his handling of foreign policy issues. Uh, he, on being elected, and when he spoke to leaders across the world who called him, uh, he emphasized the enormous soft power of India's democracy and he indicated to them that he will leverage this factor to find India's rightful place in the world. Uh, in his words, the people of India want to see a resurgent nation regaining the admiration and respect of the international community. These are sentiments, but you know where he's coming from when, when you hear them and when you hear them expressed uh, uh, repeatedly by Mr. Modi. But it is important to recognize that Mr. Modi's Indian dream is not a dream of nationalist assertion. His dream is one of empowerment and higher standards of living for the Indian people. 
He, has, he will stress the primacy of national interest, but at the same time, he has been very careful to avoid any hawkish statements of any kind, has ruled out confrontational approaches towards neighbors, and has reached out to them right at the start of his uh, innings and invited them to his swearing in. Um, he will clearly accord priority to restoring high economic growth and reestablishing the economic foundations of India's national power. This in turn will entail measures to improve the domestic and external environment for ensuring a higher growth trajectory. So you can expect a much more proactive global engagement and economic diplomacy uh, from Mr. Modi. Um, his determination to reinvigorate government institutions and strengthen government capacity will also have a beneficial impact on India's comprehensive national power, and I'm sure all friends of India uh, will celebrate that. Um, two more areas where, two obvious areas where, uh, where his domestic uh, policy will intersect with, uh, with foreign policy, mm. excuse me, are <coughs> uh, economic engagement with the world and building India's defense capacity. So in terms of reviving India's economic growth by ensuring a stable business environment free from regulatory and political uncertainty, capricious policy making and cumbersome bureaucracy, uh, this, that's one plank which he's already promised. And since taking office, he has signaled his intention to progress military modernization through a balanced mix of procurement and indigenous capacity building. Uh, <clears throat> clear and cre credible strategic posture. I do believe that Mr. Modi will contribute very meaningfully to that emerging uh, as we go ahead. And this will not only contribute to India's national deterrent capacity, and it's, but also to its potential as a net security provider alongside regional partners. Um, he said uh, this last Sunday that we will, ne we will neither threaten anyone nor will we be intimidated by anyone. We will look the world in the eye and deal with it. Now, this is a very practical, very pragmatic person. And he, he, he is really somebody who can change the normal way of India's underwhelming performance in the region and, uh, and restore India's trajectory towards becoming a major Asian power. The BJP manifesto talks about a web of alliances to strengthen India's weight on the global stage. And hopefully this implies a more pragmatic, non-ideological stance. The way I see it, the way I would like to put it, is that India will now be more aligned to its own interests and partnerships which serve them. So that clarity is, uh, is finally going to descend. The ideological baggage uh, of the past is unlikely to appear in his government. Mm. Three countries I want to talk about, and then I'll end. Uh, first, let me talk about Japan. <coughs> um, he has signaled from the beginning that he will pay the highest priority to building relations with Japan. His first major bilateral visit outside South Asia uh, will be to Japan in two weeks' time. And uh, I think that uh, you can see that that visit in early July will set the trend for India's strategic and economic uh, partnership with, with Japan coming closer and closer to a quasi-alliance uh, between the two Asian democracies. Uh, he has visited Japan twice, 2007, 2012. Uh, and I think, broadly speaking, as democratic leaders with a commitment to reigniting national self-confidence, uh, Abe and Modi have much in common. 
So th there'll be a few things which will be tied up in this visit. I don't know how much time there is, just two weeks to, uh, to, to go in for major uh, new deals and initiatives, but you can expect some in the strategic arena and in the economic arena as well. China. China, uh, from the day when this, the verdict of the Indian people was announced, uh, has been somewhat unsure of what to expect from a Modi government. And uh, during the election, he called upon China to abandon its mindset of expansion. And then also during the election, he went on to say that if India and, and China can make things work together, there will be great benefits to both nations and to a rising Asia. Uh, the Chinese leadership reached out to Modi only after he assumed office as prime minister, not on the day when he was elected. Now, there are good reasons for that because uh, uh, communist China, with its system of government, could hardly publicly acknowledge the successful transfer of power uh, through peaceful and democratic means in a vast, diverse Asian nation. Um, they, there were some commentaries before these, these initial messages uh, uh, were, it, uh, were exchanged, um, but they were a bit confused because they did not quite reach an, a balance between is Modi an economic reformer with, with whom China will gallop along, or is he a right-wing nationalist uh, of which China should have some concern. Now, uh, this was also something which they witnessed because at his inauguration, the presence of Tibetan leader Lobsang Sangye, uh, who is the, the Tibetan government in exile prime minister, uh, was, was uh, noticed by the Chinese and of course they protested, etc. But uh, finally they sent uh, their foreign minister Wang Yi to, to Delhi and uh, he was there last week. Uh, I'll just say that, that Mr. Wangi was received very warmly. His messages from the Chinese leadership were, were, uh, were gratefully acknowledged. Um, the, but following the talks, the one line which struck me uh, as part of our regular briefing was that uh, respect for sensitivities and aspirations of each other is essential for the expansion of bilateral relations. So if I derive from that what Mr. Wangi went back to Beijing with, he probably went back to Beijing with the understanding that India is prepared to work together with China, but will stand up very strongly for national interests. And uh, uh, so this, this is now going to be um, a, a basis where there will be a greater balance and greater mutuality of, of accommodation and respect which, which will come into the relationship. And it's not the same thing as what we were used to in the past. It's not quite a continuation of, uh, of the past when Mr. the UPA and Mr. Vajpayee were reaching out to China. India and the United States. Well, nobody in this town is unaware of the fact that over the past year, the India-US strategic partnership has dissipated. There's been a sense of mutual disappointment. There's a diminished political attention. There are several economic contentions and disputes which have emerged. And uh, I, I admit that there were perhaps many areas where there were grounds for US disappointment with the previous government. And these covered the economy, they covered defense, and they covered strategic arenas. Uh, but on the Indian side as well, there were questions, uh, there are questions about the nature of America's strategic commitment to relations with India. On trade and investment issues in particular, the US approach of unilateral investigations 
and the diplomacy of demands, as Rick puts it, has become completely counterproductive. Now, if this is the background, then there is a little bit more of a, uh, uh, there's more of work coming up because the US overture to candidate Modi was inexplicably delayed to February 2014. Um, there has been some recovery post-election, uh, but I don't think we can just say that the past has been entirely swept under, as there are bound to be residual grievances in India uh, about the past, which include the visa denial for Mr. Modi. Uh, maybe, maybe I think I, I cannot ascribe any reasons because I cannot ascribe, uh, define why the US acted in the way it did. But uh, perhaps I think uh, across the board these past several months, maybe the, the comprehension of the scale of change represented by Mr. Modi uh, is not being fully uh, taken on board and requires much more study. Uh, what he represents for India requires study. What, where he will take India requires greater study. So um, if there's a lack of uh, direction and clarity at the moment, it's mainly on the US side. M PM Modi has already made it very clear that he has a desire to restore the full momentum to bilateral ties. He regards America as the most consequential country for India. And he has, he has said that if a country's relations are not determined by what happens to an individual. So uh, basically from his side, he's there, he's ready to move on, move ahead. And hopefully that's what we will see happening as, as the year progresses. Now the, the, to restore the strategic vision which existed uh, for the last decade in the relationship, my belief is that the lead will have to come directly from President Obama and Prime Minister Modi. And the future direction of uh, this relationship will therefore very heavily depend on the outcomes of the September summit, which is, uh, we have still not scheduled the exact dates, but uh, the idea that there will be a summit meeting has already been uh, agreed. Uh, as far as the other nitty gritty issues with the State Department and the Indian Foreign Office, et cetera, et cetera, are concerned, I won't labor that point. I will simply say that progress on relations will be, under Modi, will be pragmatic, will be even on occasion uh, transactional, and uh, there will be new yardsticks of mutual respect and reciprocity in terms of the relationship overall. And some of these misunderstandings which arose last eight, nine months, uh, I think speak rather uh, poorly about how we have managed the relationship. Um, can we think of a BIT? Can we think of India's involvement in, 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 in greater uh, uh, levels and more advanced levels of trade and investment relations with the United States? I think, first of all, let's say that the entire course of various investigations, which are unilateral US investigations in, into India's trade and investment practices, I think this cycle has to come to an end. Because only when it comes to an end, you can really open up and start talking about something new. Uh, the way the cycle has gone on, where certain very limited agendas have become the main point in the India-US relationship, uh, I think that again has to be redressed on the US side. Uh, we, as, as the US withdraws from Afghanistan, as more dangers grow in Asia, in East Asia as well as in, uh, to the west of India, I think <clears throat> we need to step up our security uh, dialogues, our strategic dialogues. Uh, we need to address each other's concerns and anxieties. Uh, we have been doing it, we have the platforms uh, uh, which, which have been established. But uh, I think from the Indian side, we do perceive at the moment 
a need for the US to redress a shortfall on walking the talk. And that's a perception which is not limited to India. It's uh, more widely shared in, in Asia, all the way across East Asia as well. On the Indian side, much of what the Modi government is likely to do on improving the climate for economic growth and investment will fundamentally stem from domestic impulses, not US pressure. This I really want to emphasize. However, the revival of India's potential as an effective regional player and strategic partner under Prime Minister Modi will no doubt be something which would be welcomed by the United States because that is a, a beneficial impact of uh, our ability to work together with greater convergence on the important strategic issues of the day. Um, the signals by the Modi government that he will fast track military modernization, um, throw open the defense industrial sector for foreign direct investment, uh, leaves a very considerable scope for pursuing India-US defense trade and technology initiative, which has been ongoing, but nothing really transpired taking it beyond trade into the sectors where we will be actually partnering on technology sharing, co-production, uh, and uh, things of that sort. Um, so uh, hopefully this will be one of the priorities which, which will be taken up uh, when the leaders meet. On regional dialogues, I'll conclude with that. Uh, I think they, which are being revived. We, there was a long lull in our East Asia dialogue and the, the trilateral is also being revived. It's supposed to be held next week, but it's been postponed by another few weeks. Um, I think the time, I would say that the time has come for uh, India, Japan, and the United States to really progress impactful programs of cooperation which carry a meaning, direct meaning for regional states, especially the ASEAN states. And uh, we've heard a lot of proposals from the United States, including the Indo-Pacific Corridor, et cetera. But frankly, the US is far behind both India and Japan in terms of projects under implementation for connectivity in the region. And uh, uh, with, with Modi visiting Japan in a couple of weeks, I think the, the involvement of Japan and India with connecting our Northeast with Myanmar and across all the way to Vietnam, that, that trend will, will pick up speed. Uh, there's very little US equity in that, apart from statements of support for a Indo-Pacific corridor. And then there is the question of the entire maritime security, HADR related issues, which, which we can bring to the table for regional states. Uh, I think we are still dealing with these in too limited a format, which is India, Japan, US, or India, Japan, or India, US. Uh, to really be meaningful, these trilateral initiatives have to be dovetailed with ASEAN-led uh, processes which are established, but we haven't plugged into them effectively because that's the only way that the entire region will see that these three countries are working together, helping us building capacity and building maritime security. Thank you very much. I think uh, as much as I could have covered, I've covered the ground. It's been rather theoretical because, as I said, just three weeks since the new government was uh, constituted. Um, lots of room for change, lots of room for surprises. Uh, those are never something which you can uh, preclude. But uh, mm, there is a different new style of governance and a new let's say, paradigm for the utilization of a mandate for transforming India, which is uh, causing the buzz in India. And I hope that uh, people in the United States will recognize the extent and breadth of that change, what it means for India in, in the future as a society, as an economy, and as a country which can stand up uh, and be a partner, especially a partner for the United States. Thank you. Well, thanks, Ambassador. Saying that was that was really terrific. Um, there's one of the difficulties I think of dealing with a, a country that has such a such a large English language press is when you follow it from this side of the ocean. There's so much chatter and so many sources. 
uh, it gets a little confusing sometimes. So hopefully, uh, certainly for me and hopefully for others, you brought a bit of clarity and a narrative about all this uh, massive amount of activity that we've seen so far. You know, I think, I think the line that I take away is India's policies will be aligned with its uh, interests. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a terrific line, and certainly we've all seen uh, times that that's diverged in the, uh, the recent past, and also the idea of, of Mr. Modi and the BJP government as, as true change agents. And, and sometimes people say, well, it's just another government, India's been a certain way since independence. And I always, I always retort that you know, what we saw um, with these two gentlemen helping lead the charge at the time, in a, in a short span of time, India went from nuclear testing uh, to nuclear cooperation with the United States in a six-year window. Um, that's fast. That is very fast. And so you've seen these opportunities in the past where when things get aligned, they move faster than any of us can expect. And importantly, America needs to stay awake on this. You know, here again, uh, you probably saw, uh, most of you are probably on the list in the most recent newsletter that we put out, which talked about the, uh, the 28 or so dialogues that we have with India. And you know, recommending some, some changes to them which uh, the Indian press, that's all they reported on. CSIS says, blow up the dialogues and change them. Small, subtle changes. The real message of the newsletter, if you read what we wrote, was uh, go back to those dialogues. Don't give up on them. And for some things like the CEO forum, a bunch of CEOs sitting across from uh, Prime Minister Modi and his trusted advisors and offering advice on how the climate can be improved to help them bring new investments into the country uh, will probably get a better ear than they had in the past. So you know, I, I also echo. Ambassador Singh's remarks that uh, I think on this side of the ocean we need to stay awake and get ready to be responsive when we see overtures because it's going to happen in a different fashion than it has in the recent past. Yeah. Uh, let me, uh, before we open it up to the, uh, to the audience for questions, uh, one thing that I, I really, and we've been scratching our heads on this quite a bit at the office, uh, thinking about writing a paper, but then we figured you're coming, why, why bother writing when we're going to have the expert here? Uh, India-Japan relations, mm -hmm. clearly pride of place. Um, in in the the establishment right now, and we've seen it, you know, the last years of the Congress government. Um, what is it? What did you see um, that was was there like a single intellectual framework in Japan that made both government and industry approach India at the same time with such strength, or is it just a lot of pieces that kind of came together at the same time that resulted in you know what we would call in our basketball terms a full court press? where every time you turn around, there's a leader there, there's a CEO there, there's investment there. How did that sort of, when did you start to see the dawn that they're looking at this a little bit differently? It happened uh, quite rapidly in the period 2000 to 2009. Um, uh, the, the initial breakthrough came when pr uh, Prime Minister Mori just ignored the Guy Musho uh, advice and said, I don't care if India's uh, tested nuclear devices. I think there's a buzz in the Indian economy. I want to know what it's all about. And uh, you get me on a plane, I want to go and visit that country. And uh, he did that uh, primarily on prime ministerial authority, overriding uh, concerns in the foreign office, uh, made the opening in 2000. But then we had a bit of a lull because Mori, of course, left within a year. Uh, and Koizumi came to power. Now, by the time Koizumi reached his height and the relationship between Bush and Koizumi uh, really was taking the, uh, the two countries' places, uh, we also saw the phenomenon of India's economic rise uh, speed up to 8 and 9% uh, growth per annum. Uh, both Japan and the United States got very excited about it. They, uh, they, they felt that uh, this was a new opportunity and a, and a democratic country in Asia which was coming up and would be able to uh, partner uh, uh, the, the US and Japan in Asia, also provide a huge uh, uh, growth potential to the, to the world economy. Um, the, this then went on to become uh, a uh, initiative between Mr. Bush and Manmohan Singh, who by that time had become uh, prime minister. Uh, and uh, Mr. Kuz Koizumi was never going to be far behind because he, he was, he, he, if anything, he was very close to, to President Bush at the time. Um, the, the progression of uh, 
converting this into a, a bit of a flood, not quite a flood, but uh, let's say somewhat of a flood of uh, Japanese interest and investment, uh, and of uh, codifying the relationship between India and Japan. Uh, Japan lives on alliance commitments, as you know. I mean, they are your biggest ally in, in Asia. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a society which, uh, which codifies its agreements with foreign powers and works along them. So between 2006 and 2009, we signed a defense agreement, a security agreement, a comprehensive economic partnership agreement, uh, a whole range of new uh, understandings between India and Japan to become partners in an emerging Asia, to work for Asian stability and security, and to bring core prosperity to our two nations. So that's the rough uh, progression how it happened. Mr. Modi himself uh, is very, uh, uh, let me put it this way. I said during my remarks that uh, he regards uh, America as a country which is greatly consequential to India's future. And he, it's clear from the statements of the government that he attaches that kind of top priority to really building or reviving the momentum of India-US relations. Uh, Japan is his most favored country. Now, in those two visits in 2007 and 2012, uh, what he saw of the transformations which Japan had made in its own economy, in its infrastructure, in its technological capacities, et cetera, uh, it left him impressed. And please do remember that unlike most other Asian countries, or even the United States, uh, India has no historical baggage as far as Japan is concerned. Uh, we lauded the victories of the of the Japanese over the Russians in 2000, in, in 1905, uh, as a signal that Asians could become free and uh, free from European powers. Uh, all across, we we had a duality, in fact, during the independence struggle because uh, 40,000 Indian troops uh, joined uh, the, uh, the Subhash Chandra Bose's National Army and. Uh, uh, went over to the Japanese side. And 750,000 Indian troops helped the British Empire uh, take back uh, Asia from uh, the Japanese. So, but it was all done on the basis that the people of India were never at war with Japan. Mm -hmm. And so uh, rekindling that, uh, that, uh, that kind of, uh, um, Asia does not have the kind of uh, cohesiveness which Europe has, obviously. Uh, uh, single civilization, a Christian civilization, uh, with lots of connections uh, going across. We are diverse, but uh, Asian historical regionalism is a very important phenomenon, and uh, I don't think we should ignore that, because that historical regionalism is about 100 years old, and it involved Japan, it involved China, it involved India. Uh, we were not free, but, uh, but it did uh, have beginnings and roots down at that time. So picking up the threads is going to be, uh, I mean, for Mr. Modi, it's a labor of love. And uh, uh, he, he's made it very clear that uh, this is the top priority relationship for, for India. And I know he hasn't said that, but it covers the entire scope of technology, economy, security, defense, uh, Asian architecture, Asian stability. Uh, and. The stronger we are with Japan, Japan is with the United States, uh, I think this relationship uh, is a mutually supportive sort of a, uh, uh, it's, it's a virtuous cycle of uh, three relationships. The trilateral is about, uh, you know, uh, building incrementally uh, with each other. The weakest leg of this relationship at the moment is India-US. Uh, and I'll just ask one more question before opening it up, which is about India-US. So, you know, I think the perspective uh, from the US side, I know the perspective from the US side on why the relationship uh, really sort of petered out in recent years, mm -hmm. right? It, we, we made the biggest decision on, uh, in our bilateral history uh, by opening the door for civilian nuclear technology and yeah. by parliament not being able to pass a bill yeah. that actually allowed for civilian nuclear technology sharing between the two. Um, is there a chance that, that cinder in the eye in the relationship on our side 
could potentially be addressed? Or uh, do you think that's not part of the, uh, the short list of things, or even the longer list of things, that would be on Mr. Modi's uh, priority list? Do you think that ranks somewhere? <laughs> OK. No, it's, it, uh, I would say that uh, the civil nuclear agreement between India and the United States was not just about nuclear power. It was basically a strategic understanding between India and the United States that they had work to do together in shaping the world in the future. And that reassurance, that mutual reassurance, was fundamental to enabling the nuclear deal to actually come about. Now, uh, how did we deal with that? Uh, uh, not very well. And uh, the, the liability bill uh, caused concerns across the world. Uh, it caused concerns for all partners who are our potential partners for uh, developing civil nuclear energy. Um, we've been struggling to find legal uh, understandings which can skirt around the limitations uh, of uh, uh, product liability, uh, which which is in, which is covered in that in that bill. Um, when will this government be able to redress or correct that uh, that situation? Uh, I think um, if it is seen as, if we decide once again to revive civil nuclear power as a big plank in our uh, energy security policy, um, then eventually down the road, I think there should be uh, a push because the Japanese want that change, the, the French want that change, the Russians want that change. America wants to change. And uh, who worked for that deal? America did. So uh, quite clearly, uh, redressing some of the residual problems with that uh, uh, nuclear, civil nuclear deal and the, the implications of the liability bill uh, is something which we need to work on. I would also say that uh, this sense of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, mutual disappointment, which uh, you have noticed uh, in the last year or two. Um, on, the, on the economy, I completely agree. The, 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 the UPA just stopped performing and delivering on any benchmarks for, uh, for, for uh, economic growth of India itself. I mean, the, 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 the policies uh, did not quite add up at all. So, and on the, on the defense side, uh, we had a strange uh, holdback because uh, we have the most extensive defense relationship with the United States in terms of uh, military exercises. Uh, we are not allies, but we are perfectly interoperable, and especially our navies, and our air forces as well, our special forces as well. They, are, they all train together. Uh, but there was a kind of a um, hold back on that uh, in, in the previous regime. I don't think it's going to exist anymore. And finally, on the strategic element, uh, what I mentioned about the ideological baggage of our historical past and non-alignment and, and strategic autonomy and things of that kind, uh, that again was a part of the Congress uh, uh, paraphernalia and, and, and baggage of history. So uh, the it's, uh, it's something which uh, hopefully will now be permanently laid to rest and replaced by an alignment with our own interest and an line, alignment yeah. with all the friends who, may, who, who help uh, take that interest forward. Okay. Well, let me open it up to the floor and hopefully uh, folks will have some questions for Sanjay too. We need to get him uh, uh, energized here. All the difficult questions we've asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, right here in the... Uh, the we have a microphone coming around. Great, thanks. Hi, I'm Dr. Donna Wells. I'm an expert in the Russian language internet. Can you talk more about integrating the ASEAN countries into a possible regional security alliance? ASEAN countries in a regional? Into a possible regional security alliance. Yeah, OK. Um, Asian security is not going to be built around alliances. We fully recognize the fact that American alliances in Asia have 
bolstered regional stability and security and order for the last 50, 60, 70 years. There's no doubt about that. That's been a beneficial impact. We have benefited from it as well. The region's economies have greatly benefited from that. But uh, uh, the, the, given Asia's history, uh, a combination of uh, uh, historical regionalism and a, let's say, at least an attempt to have non-competitive, non-confrontational uh, security uh, architecture, that is definitely the way in which uh, Asia is, is going to go, including ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN has led this process of, uh, of cooperative regional security uh, architecture since it uh, initiated the ASEAN Regional Forum some four decades back, or some, not four decades, two, two and a half decades back. Uh, and uh, the acceptance by countries like the United States, Japan, India, of ASEAN centrality in this cooperative security architecture uh, and giving it some kind of a leader-led uh, apex through the East Asia Summit. Uh, this is something which is still very much uh, under discussion, is not really uh, moved in that direction. But it would be very good for Asia if we could move uh, in the direction of having clear-cut, uh, let's say, allocation of responsibility to the East Asia Summit as a leaders forum, to the ADMM plus as a defense minister's forum, to the ASEAN regional forum or any other uh, entity as a political and security issues uh, forum, and the ASEAN maritime forum plus as a regional maritime security forum. So th these, th these, are, these are all cooperative security architectures. They're not alliance-based. Uh, Abbasella, yep. Uh, uh, if you can wait for the, uh, just so everybody can hear, if you can wait for the, I thanks. run uh, a U.S. India Policy Institute, a small uh, not-for-profit in Washington, D.C. I just moved over from Delhi about two years. Um, I was at the NCAAR, National Council of Applied Economic Research. I'm a trained economist and a human development expert. Uh, very interesting talk, very reassuring. Um, however, it's a, it's a kind of um, uh, a bright future lying ahead in of us. And uh, although you did say that it's more change than uh, continuity, uh, but I have so far not yet got the uh, idea that we are, we are changing it, particularly on two counts, I will give that, which you missed, the economic side. Mm -hmm. Hardly 1% change so far. Budget, we'll find that out. Mm -hmm. Budget is a matter of reallocating money from this uh, budget head to another one. Uh, I know social sectors because there is a talk about defense, there is a talk about exporting arms and ammunition, but yeah. there is not talk about environment. There is not talk about environment. There is not talk about food, because we are 1.2 and growing. And Gujarat agriculture is not food agriculture. It is cotton agriculture. So we can't eat cotton you know, mm -hmm. to build up our nutrition. So I think the whole paradigm of agriculture and rural poverty mm -hmm. is not in the mindset of this government yet. I mean, that's my uh, point. Okay. But the question which I'm asking is, mm -hmm. economic side, there is hardly any change. So it's very quiet. I almost see there is nobody who understands economic in the BJP government, neither Modi nor, you know, I'm basically talking of the expertise beneath the decisions. Mm -hmm. So I see them very upset. Mm -hmm. Now, in this whole lecture of yours, mm -hmm. you miss the point about what the BJP stands what? for, what the BJP stands for, mm -hmm. as opposed to Modi. Mm -hmm. It's good to have a good professor mm -hmm. teaching all the students, his ministers, and to centralize the power. Mm -hmm. Is this the democracy we are talking about? I know the, the so-called decentralization in the previous government may, may not be the best combination, mm -hmm. but the centralization of power, which I beginning to feel, that could damage the democratic uh, uh, that's my view. Uh, I, I would like to elaborate uh, because it's not easy to get the states cooperate. Uh, do you have, a, do you have a question? We a got pretty pro. limited time, Abbasella. Do you have uh, a question in here? Although there is a quid pro quo, which is very forthcoming, 
uh, between the various parties coming in. Mm -hmm. And mind, uh, mind you, uh, there are 70% electorates are still not voted to BJP. 70% electorate did not vote to BJP yet. So there, there are more co coalitions mm -hmm. and changes going to okay. take shape. Um, and with respect to Japan, that's the cheap money, the investments, the cheap money from Japan is what is needed for infrastructure, and that's where the direction is. Yeah. But the largest consumer market is the other side of the Atlantic. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, uh, that's your perspective. Yeah. And to my mind, it continues the same uh, questions about whether Modi won at all, and does he represent any change at all in a very fundamental sense. And you've proved my point, that there is a huge amount of cynicism still out there which is not seeing what is happening in India. Uh, I'd like, uh, as far as the broad statistics are concerned, well, uh, we can debate till the cows come home, but the average of governance uh, in India has been around about 30 to 35% for the winning party. And uh, Mo uh, Modi and the BJP have 38.5%. There's no, absolutely no uh, difference from, uh, uh, from what the national average has, has been. Uh, they, the, the fact that uh, uh, you, that does not mean in any way, any shape or form, that there's, there's a kind of a, some kind of a minority government which, is, which has come to power, because this is exactly the pattern of India. And you see the length and breadth of India. We don't have that map up here, but uh, we can, uh, I mean, sure, uh, uh, we can share that with you. The, the, the transcending of all boundaries across on a single consolidating platform of national growth and regeneration. This is something which has happened for the first time. As far as uh, centra centralization and things like that is concerned, to the contrary. You just read the, uh, the, the statements coming out of the government in the last two weeks. The entire pattern is going to be cooperative federalism. And it's going to co-opt the states, take their concerns on board, and make a single enterprise out of this India growth story. One India, strong India. Now, um, you also mentioned about the agriculture and other aspects of the economy. Please read the manifesto presented by the president of India to parliament last week. The largest portion is on empowering agriculture across the board. And uh, you're right that uh, th there's a lot of BT cotton in, uh, in Gujarat. And India's, uh, uh, let's say, rice and wheat bowls are, are elsewhere in Andhra and in, in Punjab and Haryana and other places, uh, Maharashtra. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, the biggest way of showing inclusion is to improve the productivity of our agriculture once again. And uh, that's, that's, that's clearly something uh, which the government intends to do. Uh, I don't know where you get the 1% change uh, idea from uh, uh, in the economy. There's no change at all. I mean, we, we've got to wait for the budget. What he has done so far is to say, let me get the government of India working again. That in itself is a huge chunk of per capita national GN, uh, GDP growth in the future. Uh, second, uh, he has uh, uh, said that we will have an investor-friendly approach so that people can invest happily in India. Our own domestic investment cycle has shrunk. We used to have 38% uh, investment rate and 17% private investment rate. We are down to 10, 11% private investment. This entire thing has to be revived. Uh, taxation reform, uh, GST tax across the board, um, uh, uh, across India. Each one of these are incremental uh, inputs into the, to the happier, healthier growth of the Indian economy. As far as structural reform is concerned, let's wait and see at what pace the, the, the government will pursue that. Uh, I keep saying, I think, I think businesses I mean, they want big reform. Yeah. Want they want big reform, but they also don't need big reform necessarily. They want a government that is uh, uh, targeting them less, that is more friendly. And so, you know, I, I keep saying, you look at the real numbers already. 
uh, since the start of the year, um, the FDI numbers released by the government of India, up 41% in the first three months. That's even before voting began. 41% increase in FDI, plant property and equipment. Institutional investment. It's already 50% higher this year than it was all of last year. So the numbers are showing that indeed investors are, are choosing India uh, at a pretty astounding rate just because they view the government's going to be friendlier, even if they don't know what the specific policy changes are going to be. Sanjay. Yeah, I mean, two points have been raised here. One, that the BJP got nearly 31%, so therefore, somehow the representative nature of the government seems to be a little diluted. Uh, I don't think that's an approach that we need to take. Uh, in a multi-party democracy, when four or five parties contest elections, here a dozen uh, regional parties contest elections, getting 31% is a huge thing. It's not a small thing. Uh, and the other dimension is uh, trying to compare this 31% with the percentages that the political parties got during earlier elections. I think it's like comparing apples and oranges, because the nature of uh, the representational density in India has increased substantially. I mean, I'll give you an example. For instance, uh, there is this party called Pyramid Party of India, which contested elections in Kostlandra. I mean, what have pyramids got to do with India? But somehow there is a party called Pyramid Party of India, which is contesting elections in coastal areas. What do they believe in? They believe that if you have a small image like pyramid on your head, all the spiritual energy will flow into you. And these guys are contesting elections. And now these guys got certain percentage of votes. Uh, what does it mean? I mean, we can laugh at this agenda of this political party. But it means that there are people with various persuasions, various ideologies contesting elections in India, and they're taking vote share. And Indian political party's system is allowing that kind of system to flourish. And that's the nature in which, in the context in which, you need to understand this 31%. In 80s and 90s, trying to make entry into political process of this country means people would have said, told you, you would get bummed off if you tried to contest election as an independent. But today, nobody is afraid of contesting elections. Few software engineers come together, put up a party, and run a collection campaign. They are running elections, contesting elections. They may lose deposits. So therefore, when we try to assess the nature of the percentage that the political parties like BJP or Congress have got, we need to understand the nature of the change, the increased representational density in Indian politics. So therefore, for me, whether it is Congress or BJP, getting 30% is a huge thing in Indian politics. And we need to understand this dynamic rather than run it down. The other dimension is about centralization of politics. I mean, this is, we, should be, we should be very careful about centralization of power in Indian politics. But this is not the first time that the question has come up. Indira Gandhi used to fire elected chief ministers of the state just like that. Today, you cannot fire a chief minister of Andhra, in, in any state in, in, in India so easily. Governors who are appointed by the central government the union government today is finding it difficult to remove them because they're political appointees of the previous government. Even there, they're finding it difficult to remove uh, governors. Yes, we should be careful about centralization of power, but the nature of politics, the structures that are operating in Indian politics makes it extremely difficult to have certain amount of centralization of power. So the person who asked this question is not in the room today. I mean, no. just left now. I'll let him know. I see him every couple hours, so, so I'll those pass questions. along the rest of your answer. <laughs> <laughs> These things need to be factored in, the complexity of the issue. Yeah. The vote share percent, too, there's another one from the Book of Dirty Tricks uh, in India, where uh, uh, other parties will run a number of candidates against the leading candidate with the exact same name. And occasionally they'll take a, a two or three percent or four yeah. percent each one. So BJP member of parliament I saw uh, that. <laughs> had uh, candidates, twelve candidates with same names contesting the elections. <laughs> uh, we got time for uh, for one more. Let's go to the uh, second row right over here. Uh, microphone's coming over there. If you can keep it brief and let us know who you are. Uh, my name is Barbara Dello. Um, I wanted to pick up on two things you said. I hope I got them right. You spoke about nationalisms, and you said that Modi got some of his support from the economic middle class and social, those with social conservative values, I believe, if that's correct. And I wanted you to uh, expand, uh, two, two things, I wanted you to expand on the social conservative values and also wonder if uh, there's any element um, of, of the global um, liberal agenda that sometimes is exported from the UN and even the US that um, may conflict with some of the, um, um, that may interfere with relations with India. So what is the social element in the party and how may global 
liberal affairs. No, he, he, uh, the subject can answer parts of that. I'll, I'll simply say that uh, India is, uh, is and will always remain a liberal democracy. The, the quality of uh, rights enjoyed by our people will only benefit from the kind of phenomenon which Mr. Modi represents because he wants to move India on the same platform as you enjoy in the United States, which is a single citizenry under the Constitution and the law. And uh, with, with equality of opportunity given to everybody through a universal access model rather than a compartmentalized, uh, uh, what is it called in America? The, the, uh, uh, the reservations are called something else. In affirmative, America, action. affirmative action uh, sort of a model. And uh, we haven't had that thought for a long time. We, uh, the, uh, we've started believing that we are always going to be fragmented, that we are a conglomeration of communities coming together with some complex web of uh, interactive exchange of benefits uh, distributed across uh, 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 on that front. Now, uh, for me, as a practitioner, including a person who represented India at the Commission on Human Rights, uh, I would say that I, I, we really need to stand by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the American Constitution and our Constitution, which are all based on individual rights guaranteed under law. And that's the direction, kind of direction which we will always have. There's, there's going to be no dilution of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, the analytic frameworks that we deploy, whether it is word liberal, may mean different things in different contexts. Similarly, the word right-wing nationalist may mean different things in different contexts. Narendra Modi is a right-wing nationalist. Xi Jinping is a nationalist. Shinzo Abe is a nationalist. I mean, the word nationalist does not capture the complexity that goes into uh, defining certain things. And similarly is the word liberal. When we say, uh, is Narendra Modi government or the BJP government or NDA government, is it going to be liberal? It may mean different things. Uh, yes, uh, 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 it, it may be liberal in its economic policies, definitely. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, he will follow Thatcherism or Reaganomics, uh, because you cannot deploy same kind of frameworks in Indian context, where the governments need to do welfare programs. But at the same time, you have to facilitate social mobility, which requires growth. So you need to find a middle ground uh, where you need to address both these concerns. So the framework such as liberal uh, economic policies uh, may mean different things in Indian context. Yeah. Well, in just a, uh, just a couple of weeks, we'll get to see a lot more on what India's economic agenda will look like, as <laughs> Ambassador Singh mentioned, with the release of the budget and the accompanying budget speech by Finance Minister Jay Lee in Parliament. Um, then over the summer, uh, we supposedly will see the U.S.-India Strategic Dialogue meet. So Secretary Kerry will meet Minister Swaraj, and possibly in September then, a uh, meeting of the heads of state. So uh, certainly the economic agenda will become clearer, and what happens in our bilateral relations. If we don't know by the end of the year, we likely will never know. Um, but I suspect <laughs> we're going to know quite a bit and pretty shortly. So thanks, everybody, for coming. And, jo and join me in thanking our two terrific guests here.